Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the ninth module of the History of Christianity II course. In the previous sections, we looked at how the Church grew in the United States through various waves of awakening and renewal, and in this section, we'll expand out to look at how the Church expanded and grew in various places around the world, primarily through the missionary efforts of those from the churches that we've learned about in the previous few modules. In this section, we'll learn about the missionary movement of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. We'll just highlight a few stories, even though the history of missions could be an entire course on its own. These stories we'll look at, they're, they're not necessarily the first missionaries, they're not necessarily the most important, but they're probably the most well-known and influential for missions. And so, they're important for understanding the missionary movement at that time. Now, let's start with the timeline to put these events in the context of the other things that you've already learned. Bartolomeus Ziegenbalg arrived in India in 1706, and he printed a New Testament in the Tamil language in 1714. David Brainerd started missionary work with the natives in New England in 1742. In 1749, Jonathan Edwards published the life and diary of David Brainerd. In 1792, William Carey published the pamphlet called An Enquiry into the Use of Means. He sailed to India in 1793, and Serampore College was started in 1818. The Haystack Prayer Meeting happened in 1806, and in 1813, Adoniram Judson arrived in Burma. He baptized his first convert in 1819 and published the Bible in Burmese in 1835. Then in 1854, Hudson Taylor arrived in Shanghai, China for the first time, and in 1865, he began the China Inland Mission. The Edinburgh Conference on Missions took place in 1910, and in 1956, Jim Elliott and others were killed by natives they were trying to reach. So, this section is covering just a few events spread over a large time span. Now, let's examine each of these subjects in more depth, and we'll start with the big picture context. Christianity had spread in every direction after Christ, and it had succeeded in evangelizing all of Europe. Evangelism to the south and east was cut off by the Muslim conquests, and to the west was endless ocean, as far as they knew at that time. So there was little missionary activity and concern for missions in medieval Europe, because there was little reasonable possibility for it. But then, when trade and discovery introduced Europe to the reality of the rest of the world, then missionary activity started again in earnest. In the first history course, we covered the early Roman Catholic missions and missionaries in the Age of Exploration, so I won't repeat that information here. I'll just briefly review it. The Spanish in Central and South America basically conquered and subjugated the natives, but there were also missionaries who evangelized and served the natives and who were a great help and blessing to them. The Jesuit Francis Xavier evangelized with great success in India, what is now Malaysia, and Japan. Matteo Ricci won an audience in China because of his knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and geography. He evangelized among the Chinese upper classes. But he was also accused of syncretism, that is, compromising Christianity by mixing it with the native religions and philosophies. He allowed converts to retain much of their ancient religion, and therefore he came under fire for his methods in what is called the Chinese Rite Controversy. And Roberto de Nobili followed a similar pattern in India. He acted like a Brahmin to reach that caste, and was also accused of syncretism. Now, these Roman Catholic missionary stories happened just before and during the time of the Protestant Reformation. And then after the Protestant churches became established, they also began missionary activities. In the section on German pietism, we briefly looked at the Moravians at Herrnhut. They sent out many missionaries to many places. I just want to highlight one as an example. A man named Bartolomeus Ziegenbalg went to Tranquilbar in southern India in 1706. He learned the Tamil language, 
and translated and published the Bible in Tamil in 1714. And of course, he evangelized and gathered believers into churches. And he founded schools to teach people to read so they could read the Bible. He was a student of Indian culture so that he could make a credible presentation of the gospel that would connect with them. And he also provided for medical assistance and trained local leaders to carry on the missionary work. Now, Ziegenbald was not the only missionary sent by the Moravians, not even close. There were approximately 2,000 missionaries sent out in the 1700s. They went to the Danish Virgin Islands, to Greenland, to Suriname, to South Africa, to Estonia, to Labrador, and to many other places around the world, including the missionaries to Georgia that strongly influenced the Wesley brothers. And there are many other stories that should be told about the Moravian missionaries, but we'll move on to a man named David Brainerd. He was a Puritan in New England who became a missionary to the natives there. He started missionary work among a few tribes with little success, but in 1745 through 1746, he had great success with natives near Trenton, New Jersey, along the manner of the Great Awakening. He also helped them to set up a new community. But then, because of his bad health, he moved in with Jonathan Edwards, and he died of tuberculosis at the age of 29 in Edwards' household. Now, by far the biggest impact of David Brainerd was the fact that after his death, Edwards published his biography of Brainerd, which is largely made up of Brainerd's personal journal, giving his own thoughts about his ministry. In this journal, Brainerd communicated his spiritual fervor and the privations and sufferings that he endured for the sake of the natives and his zeal for their salvation and the glory of God. And this journal was the means that God used to call countless people into missionary service afterwards because they caught Brainerd's vision and zeal for sacrificial commitment to a greater cause, and they tasted the authenticity and faith demonstrated by Brainerd, and many were inspired to live their life in a similar manner. Next, I want to talk about a man named William Carey, who has been called the father of modern missions. He was a Baptist shoemaker who grew more and more serious and passionate about his faith. He was then asked to preach and take on pastoral duties. He read about Captain Cook's voyages to faraway places along with his Bible reading, and he also read the life and journal of David Brainerd, and all of these together convinced him of the missionary calling of the church to reach other nations. Now, when he told a group of ministers his ideas about this, one of them said, Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Now, Carey did not agree with that statement, and in response, he wrote and published a pamphlet entitled, An Enquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. And he spoke of the need for Christians to go to the nations. And he often challenged audiences with this statement, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And then he got the opportunity to take his own advice. In 1793, he left for India. His wife refused to go, but later relented and went after him. But she was a constant source of hindrance and discouragement to them. She was homesick and discouraged and suffered from mental illness. They eventually settled in a place called Serampore. With two or three helpers, he pursued evangelism and church planning. He did similar tasks as Ziegenbald did. He translated the Bible into around 44 different Indian languages and dialects. Carey was very good with languages. And he published Bibles and Christian literature. He founded and taught in colleges, and that included Serampore College, started in 1818 for the training of native evangelists and pastors but it also trained people in agriculture and science, because Carey himself was scientifically minded, and he took part in social and agricultural reforms for the betterment of that society. In 1800, he baptized his first Indian convert, a man named Krishna Paul. By the end of his ministry, he had seen 
thousands of converts. He had raised up many native leaders, and he provided the scriptures in native languages, and also inspired countless others to missionary work. He truly was a pioneer and inspiration for much of the Protestant missionary explosion in his time and after. Next, I want to mention the Haystack Prayer Meeting. This was a group of five students at Williams College in Massachusetts. They met outside for prayer one day, but a brief thunderstorm started, and they took refuge under the shade of a haystack and continued to pray. There, they pledged themselves to missionary service and to promoting missionary work. And that was the beginning of one of the first and most influential missionary movements to come out of America. One of the students was named Samuel Mills. He led in the formation of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions in order to promote missions, to recruit and send missionaries. And they sent out more than 1,250 missionaries in the first 50 years, and thousands more in the years after that. Mills also helped start the American Bible Society and the United Foreign Mission Society. Now, all of that started with five friends at a prayer meeting. So don't be shy about starting small. You just never know what God can do. Now, one of the missionaries that came out of that movement was a man named Adoniram Judson. He and his wife Anne were the first missionaries sent out from the USA. While they were sailing for India, they changed from Congregationalist to Baptist because they had studied the Bible about baptism on the trip. They tried to enter India, but were hindered by the politics of the East India Company. Therefore, they eventually settled in Burma. So they were alone in a poverty-stricken country with a difficult language to learn. And the majority Buddhist people there had no native idea of an eternal and personal God which they could use as a foothold for an explanation and proclamation of Christ. So that was a difficult task, which seemed hopeless at first. But they persevered and prayed. And after a while, they settled on using the concept of a zayat. This was a native concept of a shelter that was open to anyone who wanted to rest and or to discuss the day's events, kind of like a hospi hospitality tent. So they secured a zayat on a busy street, patterned after the native customs that they had observed, and people began to visit them, and they had the first convert within a month. Judson translated the Bible, and the first converts took an active role in evangelism, so the church grew. Later, when war broke out between England and Burma, Judson was arrested and tortured as a spy. And after years, he was finally released, and he returned to missionary work. Then his wife died, which sent him into a severe depression and mental illness. But when he recovered, he returned to missionary work. At his death, there were around 100 churches and 8,000 believers in Burma, and the result of their work continues in Burma to this day. Next is a man named Hudson Taylor. He's the pioneer of what is now called faith missions. I'll explain that term in a minute. But it's laid out in a book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, which was written by his son, and I highly recommend that book. It tells the story of Taylor's ministry and the China Inland Mission and how God came through in mighty ways on behalf of Taylor and his mission time after time after time. Now, Hudson Taylor knew as a young man that he was called to be a missionary to China, and so he prepared himself. He studied medicine as a way to gain a hearing and to help people, and he also practiced self-denial by living very simply with the poor in London. He practiced not relying on anyone but God. One example, he refused to remind his employer of his overdue pay, but instead he prayed that God would move his employer to pay him. He reasoned in this way. He said, when I go out to China, I shall have no claim on anyone for anything. My only claim will be on God. How important, therefore, to learn before leaving England to move man through God by prayer alone. Now. That attitude and practice is what is called faith missions, to ask and trust God to supply all that is needed. 
Taylor sailed for China in 1853 at the age of 21, and he arrived and settled in Shanghai in 1854. Then he traveled up the Yangtze River. Every other missionary had stayed along the coast, protected by the trading stations. But Taylor went into the interior of the country, where no one had heard of Christ. He was the first Protestant ever to go to many of the places he went. And he was seen as a curiosity, and he drew attention, which gave him a hearing for the gospel. Now, Taylor adopted Chinese dress and culture. He wore the native-style robes and grew his hair into a ponytail. As much as possible, he became like the Chinese to win the Chinese. And Taylor raised up other missionaries to help and sent them into remote areas, far beyond the protection of Western imperialism. He promoted the indigenization of new churches, that they would adopt as much as possible the native manners and customs, and not try to impose Western ritual on Chinese people. However, he was a bit weak on training natives for leadership at first. Rather, he relied on importing Westerners to lead the churches. Now, this mission grew and was organized into the China Inland Mission in 1865. Taylor traveled back and forth many times to China, Europe, America, and Australia to raise up workers and support. He did not work primarily with upper-class educated Englishmen, but he worked with middle and lower classes, both for the support and for the workers, because he wanted workers who were not afraid of hardship and deprivation. China Inland Mission missionaries were not salaried, but they were trained to rely on God for support. And China Inland Mission was headquartered in China, not in England. And it had missionaries in every province of China by 1882. It was 800 workers strong at Taylor's death, and continued to expand after his death to reach all of China with the gospel, without relying on outside leadership and support. Now, Taylor's ministry almost single handedly brought the gospel to the majority of the territory of China and its effects can still be seen today. Next, I want to mention the Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910, which is also known as the World Missionary Conference. Now, missionaries from different denominations had been cooperating on the various mission fields because they were working in a common cause, and therefore many of the Western churches recognized the need to more formally cooperate to reach the rest of the world for Christ. And they came together to strategize and plan at Edinburgh, Scotland. They expressed hope that, quote, a unity begun in the mission field may extend its influence and react upon us at home and throughout the old civilizations. And they expressed a need for continuing missionary effort. They said, no one can follow Christ without following him to the uttermost parts of the earth. And they expressed hope and the real possibility for finishing the task. They said, living faith will make it possible for him to use us for the immediate conquest of the world. Now, this missionary conference represents the high tide of missionary expansion. In 1800, less than 25% of the world was Christian. But by 1910, because of the work of people like those we just examined, around 35% of the world was now Christian. And that's a huge gain in one century, and it was starting to grow exponentially. And this conference also marked the end of an era where the church was mostly white and Western. At Edinburgh, only 18 of the 1,200 delegates were non-Western, but in later conferences that came out of this, the number of non-Western representatives greatly expanded. The cooperative work continued after the conference and eventually led to the World Council of Churches. Now, I want to tell one final story, which is much more modern, happening in the 1950s. A group of five American friends decided to try to reach the group known as the Aka Indians. The Akas lived in the jungles in modern-day Ecuador, beside a river that eventually flowed into the Amazon, and they were notorious for their hostility and violence both to outsiders and even among their own people. No outsider had ever been able to live in Aka territory. But 
These five Americans decided to reach them and prayed and planned, even though they knew it was risky. One of the men, named Jim Elliott, wrote in his journal, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now, they began to fly a small plane over an Aka village, dropping gifts and photos of themselves, and they received signs of friendship, and therefore they landed on a sandy riverside on January 3rd, 1956, not far from the village. Two days later, they made contact with three Akas, and the day after that, they were attacked and all the missionaries were speared to death, and their airplane was slashed up. Now, this event made worldwide news. Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, one of the victims, said, No regrets. This was not a tragedy. God has a plan and purpose in all things. And then other missionaries, including Elizabeth Elliot, later cautiously made contact and brought the gospel to the Akas, some of whom were converted, including some who were involved in the killings. Now, I tell the story for two reasons. First, it is an example of willing risk and sacrifice to reach the unreached. Second, because this story is famous, it was widely told in the press at the time, and multiple books and movies have been made to tell the story from different angles. And from that publicity, there arose a renewed zeal for missionary activity and sacrifice for the sake of Christ, even in our day. Now, we've looked at just a few from thousands of great missionary stories. I, I highly recommend finding and reading more of these histories. Your faith and zeal will be charged by the great and miraculous things that God regularly did to reach the nations through his faithful and obedient servants. Now, we will come back to more history of Christianity around the world in a later module. But now, let me say a few words of evaluation about this historical period. First, there was tremendous cost. And by that, I partly mean the financial, to send and support missionaries and the needed infrastructure. But I'm primarily speaking of the tremendous human cost. An early death from natural causes was expected by most Western missionaries, especially in Africa, because of tropical diseases. Life expectancy of missionaries was very short. It was standard practice for missionaries going to foreign lands to ship their luggage with them in their own coffin, because they did not expect ever to return. In addition, many missionaries and their first converts were martyred for their faith by hostile natives. Jim Elliot and his friends are only one of many examples of missionary martyrs. There are multiple stories where the first missionary to a particular place was eaten by cannibals or speared to death, but before they died, they were able to make enough of an impression that the next missionary there was able to come and successfully reach the people for Christ. The blood of the martyrs continued to be the seed of the church. Next is the idea that I call contextualized but not compromised. This is a concept that applies not only to missionary strategy, but also to church strategy in our own culture. Let me try to explain first by contrasting a few stories. In the Middle Ages, St. Boniface, a missionary to the Germanic peoples, he chopped down their sacred oak tree in order to prove that the Christian God is greater than their gods. And then, in the Age of Exploration, Roberto de Nobili, a missionary to India, adopted the Brahmin ideas and lifestyle to the point that he was accused of syncretism, of compromising Christianity in order to reach Hindus. And Hudson Taylor was somewhere in between. He adopted Chinese dress and customs up to a point, but taught faithful Christianity to the Chinese. Sometimes missionaries challenge the culture. Sometimes they work with the culture. Sometimes they accept the culture too much. In some sense, a missionary to any culture must challenge that culture with the eternal truth claims of the gospel. And if the culture disagrees, the culture is wrong. But at the same time, 
the missionaries should not insist on the culture and traditions from their home country if the Bible does not insist on them either. You know, imagine traveling to the hot and humid jungles and teaching the natives that they need to wear a heavy wool suit to church because that's what you wore back in your native England. That would be silly as well as sweaty. But that's actually what some missionaries did. And yet, on the other side, if you went to a tribe of cannibals, you, you have to tell them that they can't be Christian and continue to be cannibals. The holy character of God does not allow murder and cannibalism. In other words, part of the missionary task is to teach people that God speaking through the Bible is the primary functional authority. And that also means that the customs of the sending church, they're not the authority. Unless, of course, they come from and conform to the Bible, to whatever extent they do. Therefore, I recommend an approach similar to what Hudson Taylor did. Speak their language, try to adopt to their customs as much as possible to make them comfortable and meet them where they're at, and speak to them in a way that makes sense to them. Yet, at the same time, be careful never to compromise the truth or standards which God has given. Everyone is called to repent and believe. Everyone is called to die to themselves and take up their cross. But every church needs to work out what that looks like and how they can best live out what Scripture teaches in every culture and context. And that does not necessarily look like what you grew up with in your own context. What is appropriate here may not be appropriate there. You see, the gospel fits in every culture. The gospel speaks to every culture. But the gospel also confronts, challenges, and changes every culture. So, contextualize for every culture, but never compromise the truth for the sake of any culture. All right, now let's review. We reviewed the early Roman Catholic missionaries, and then we saw the stories of some notable Protestant missionaries like the Moravians, David Brainerd, William Carey, the Haystack Meeting, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, the Edinburgh Conference, and Jim Elliot. We saw the great cost of missions, but also the great fruit of expanding the church toward the end of the earth, with the ideal of contextualizing the church without compromise. And that brings us to some discussion and application questions. First, what did you learn from the missionary movement that will help you be a better witness for Christ? Describe something that stood out to you as insightful and or inspirational. Why did that stand out to you, and why do you think it's important? In what ways does it inspire you to be a better witness? What principles did you learn that will help you to do so? And is there anything that stood out as a warning of what to avoid doing? If so, what and why? And how do you intend to apply these insights in your own life and ministry? Second, what have you learned from the history of the missionaries of this time period that will help you to understand and apply the concept of contextualized without compromise? How can the church contextualize the gospel without compromising into syncretism? What are some examples that you've seen of what to do? What are some examples of what not to do? Ideally, how should this work out cross-culturally? And what should it look like in your own culture? What examples and insight can you learn from and follow in your own context? And how do you intend to live out this idea and guard against possible mistakes? Now, finally, is the open-ended question. What else did you learn, and how does it apply? All right, hopefully you know the drill by now. It is time to pause for discussion and working through what you've learned. And then whenever you're ready, restart the video for some guiding principles. And I'll see you then. So pause the video now. All right, welcome back for some guiding principles. The first principle is that we should be witnesses and make disciples. 
One of the last things Jesus commanded his followers was to go into all the world and make disciples, the Great Commission. And he's never retracted or canceled that command. We are still under obligation to do this. Some can stay home and work to send others. Some can go across the ocean, and some can go across the street. There are people all around the world, even in your neighborhood, who need to be told about Jesus. And we are responsible to be his witnesses in whatever way we're able. And not just to tell about Jesus, but also to help train people to live under his lordship after they believe and are born again. Being witnesses and making disciples is one of the key reasons for the existence of the church. Second, as individual Christians, we should be totally devoted to Christ. Now, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not yet what I could or should be. I have a lot of room to grow, and the people we looked at in this section put me to shame. But I can be, and I hope you will be, inspired to rise up and follow their example, to be more zealous and devoted than before, to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. We can get stuck in a rut and think that our routine is the way it'll always be, but history reminds us that it can be better, and history motivates us to make the necessary changes. So ask yourself, what would it look like if I was totally sold out for Christ? And then do that. And that's related to the next principle. We should be willing to make sacrifices for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Remember the quote from Eliot, that we should give up the things we can't keep for the sake of things we can't lose. We should risk earthly things like money and comfort and reputation for the sake of heavenly treasure and for the sake of the eternal souls of other people. I want to avoid the mistake of some who will tell you that every Christian should sell everything and go to the mission field. That's not true. Some people need to stay home and send them and give for their support. Some need to reach your neighborhood. Some need to, to raise up the next generation in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And some need to live out their Christianity as salt and light in their workplace. And yes, some need to go to different nations that have not yet heard of Christ. But don't let me tell you how you should sacrifice for Christ. But let me encourage you that any sacrifice you make will totally be worth it. And let me encourage you to pray about the particular way or ways that God is calling you to live more sacrificially and more boldly for Him. Next, whether you're in your hometown or whether you've traveled to a foreign country, you should test every culture by Scripture. Scripture is the authority, not the culture and traditions of any time or place. Ask what needs to be embraced, ask what is indifferent, and ask what needs to be challenged in any culture using biblical standards. And that's closely related to the principle of contextualize without compromise. Jesus is Lord of every time and place. Jesus fits in every culture, and the Holy Spirit has gone ahead of any missionary to the farthest reaches of the planet to prepare the way for the gospel. So if you do go somewhere, find those points of connection. Find the common human condition and the common need for Christ, and find the way to communicate Christ that makes sense and connects in that time and place. But at the same time, never compromise the truth. You might start with some particular thing that makes sense to them, but eventually proclaim the whole counsel of God. All that the Bible teaches. Teach people to obey all he has commanded. That's the things that make sense to them in their culture and the things that don't yet make sense. The things that fit and the things that challenge. Connect with the culture where they're at, but work to change the culture to conform more closely with the character and revelation of God. And never compromise the character and revelation of God in order to fit or please any culture. And that principle does not just apply across the ocean in the mission field. That same idea 
applies profoundly in our own culture, because our current culture is trying to push the church into compromise with this world's ideas about sex and politics and justice and a whole bunch of other things, even trying to, to twist Christian words and arguments for their deception. But we should recognize that for the betrayal that it is and resist it. Never compromise. All right, that's all we'll be able to cover in this section. Like I mentioned, this is just the smallest taste of the many great missionary stories of how Christ has been building his church around the world. And I hope you understand some of the ways that this has happened in the past. And I pray that you're inspired about the possibilities to take part in similar ministry in the present. And I pray you're empowered and directed how you personally can contribute to fulfilling the Great Commission. Like I said, we'll come back in a future section to look more at the church around the world. But in the next section, we'll come back to concentrate on Europe and North America, to examine some historical challenges to the church, and to see some ways that the church responded poorly to them, and some ways the church responded well. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for watching.